This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, Indiana's art treasures, not just the artwork residing here, but the museums that house these works, the very special sense of place represented by landmarks like the Richmond Art Museum and the David Owsley Museum of Art in Muncie. This is a marvelous resource in East Central Indiana and really for the entire state of Indiana in a beautiful environment. And I'd like people to come here and see it and be wowed like all the other visitors that come today. A look at the Muncie Downtown Canal, and actually downtown itself, in a way you haven't seen before. But first, this can be kind of a tough time of year for those of us trying to stay in shape or even lose weight. Even the Greenway looks kind of, well, cold and gray this time of year. So some of the best opportunities for exercise happen indoors, places like this, Worthen Arena. This is the adult physical fitness program open to the public at Ball State University. One of the most faithful attendees just so happens to be Lenny Kaminsky, a professor of exercise science and director of the Fisher Institute for Wellness and Gerontology. Probably the biggest thing that people uh, have, have given up on, you know, they almost feel like fitness is what these elite athletes you see you know, sports, uh, that, that, that's what fitness is. And because they can't do those type of things, it's almost like we've given up to a degree on fitness versus just using our bodies naturally. And, you know, one of the things I learned uh, very early on when I got into the field of exercise physiology is that, you know, our bodies were designed to move. And if we don't use our bodies regularly, they will deteriorate faster. Certainly with age, our bodies tend to decline but if we're not using them regularly, they decline at a faster rate. And it's almost like what we're seeing in our population is accelerated aging due to lack of physical activity. We hear a lot uh, in our country nowadays about the obesity epidemic. So that's causing tremendous strain on the body just by carrying all that excess mass and particularly the fat mass and what that does to kind of the body's physiology, the heart and diabetes and all these chronic diseases that it impacts. But the other side of it that we kind of don't recognize as often, unless we think about it, is also the lack of physical activity. So we're seeing people now that are in their 50s and 60s and aren't able to do as many things physically as maybe 20 or 30 years ago just because of deconditioning and the excess body mass they have. We're used to thinking about the contrast between our sedentary lifestyles today, all that time in front of the TV for example, compared with busier, harder working people decades ago. Particularly with the obesity epidemic, um, but you know the physical activity uh, statistics are pretty alarming too, how few people in our country do what would be considered the recommended amount of exercise. And even if we would go out on the street and ask people how much exercise or physical activity would you get, it's probably not recognized as much. And it's, it's really a basic thing that's out there nowadays. The physical activity guidelines for Americans say 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days a week. That would be a recommended amount of physical activity. Doesn't seem too much, really. And you know, moderate exercise would be going out for a brisk walk. So doing a 30 minute brisk walk, even if you broke it up in three 10 minute time periods would kind of meet the recommendation. Some people are trying, like these walkers at Worthen Arena at Ball State, a good place to get away from the cold. But if this concourse looks a little empty, there's a reason. A government study found that nearly 80% of Americans don't get the recommended amount of physical exercise. Professor Kaminsky says another study shows it's more than 90% because many people overestimate how much exercise they get. The common thing people do is they, when you ask them about that, well, I'm, I'm really busy. I'm really busy, which means I must be probably really active. Therefore, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of activity throughout the day, where in reality, the busyness are more sedentary type activities. It's computer screen time, different things like that. Our work lives have become very hectic and busy that way, but our work lives also have kind of taken a lot of movement out of it. Not surprisingly, fitness and our lack of it are things that can be measured. 
A number that we use, or a term we use in kind of clinical practice, particularly when we're talking with, you know, hospital-based professionals, and it's a term called a MET. And MET stands for metabolic equivalent. And it's a concept where if we say one MET is what we're doing right now, our resting level of energy expenditure. And then when we do activity, we could say how many times above rest is that? So walking is considered a three to four MET activity. Okay, so you've elevated above your resting rate about three to four times. And so now when we think about the person's fitness level, we could put that in terms of METs. What is your maximal capacity? And kind of the average, maybe American male, 40-year-old male or something, would be around 10 METs. So when you think of walking, yeah, that's a fairly comfortable type of thing. But as we age that fitness level will decline. And so now that brisk walk is going to become a little bit more of a challenge for some people. And if your fitness really declines because you're not doing regular activity, now that brisk walk will almost be like, almost like a maximal effort is going to be required. So it's become pretty challenging. The good news, you don't have to be a triathlon competitor to get the benefits of exercise. This is one of those things where a little really goes a long way. The recommendation would be 30 minutes a day of moderate intensity, which would be kind of defined as a brisk walking pace. Now, if you do more than that, you will get more benefit. We call that the threshold. There's clearly scientific evidence that people get good results from that level of exercise. Our lifestyles are very uh, full these days is maybe the easiest way to think of that. And so again, unless we're making that personal choice that I need to put activity in there and it really is where do you put health on the spectrum of importance for yourself and if health is important physical activity is an essential thing for that. Joe Hazlitt a retired physician is a regular at the adult physical fitness program at Ball State. He usually comes three times a week hitting the exercise machines trying to reach his target heart rate. I'm 67 I've just recently retired. Um, I um, I've always had some form of exercise. Um, when I was younger, you know, I played sports in high school and some in, in college and, and all the way through college and, and further on I lifted weights. Uh, somewhere along the line I started playing racquetball probably 40 years ago and pretty much that's been my major exercise. Everybody who joins the fitness program gets a detailed health assessment using state-of-the-art equipment. The layperson thinks of, they may have heard the term a stress test. So if you went to the doctor's office and maybe were having some chest discomfort or something or the hospital, um, you would have that test done over at the hospital where they would monitor your electrocardiogram during the test, doing maximal exercise, pretty vigorous exercise, typically on a treadmill. Sometimes if people have joint problems, it could be done on a bike. But what we're going to see today is a test on the treadmill. So during the test, what we're going to do is monitor the person's electrocardiogram, their blood pressure, as well as we're going to collect their breathing, okay? So we're going to be able to measure how their lungs are functioning, look at the oxygen that's going into the bloodstream through what we're able to measure through that. So that's, the, the outcome measure of that is called a person's VO2 max, you know, or, or the term we've been using is cardiorespiratory fitness, your fitness level. So this is the gold standard measure of how fitness is actually reported for individuals. Walking is a good, safe choice for a person just starting to exercise, and it can be a social outlet, too. These Ball State retirees meet regularly to walk laps at Worthen Arena. They're out of the cold, there's plenty of light, and company. Former men's track coach Jerry Rushton retired in 2000, but still teaches physical fitness classes here. He's 60 years older than some of the students, but has a message about the benefits of staying in shape. Sleep better, eat better. Um think better, uh, and feel better in general. Uh, and uh, it's the cheapest form of medicine you can buy. It doesn't cost anything. And while he preaches moderation, he still keeps a pretty busy exercise schedule himself. This summer, I was cycling uh, five to 10 miles, about six days a week. And I just started a walking, a cycling program. Um, and a while ago, I went 4.30 miles on the exercise bike, so uh, getting back into it. He's still going while recovering from a heart pacemaker implant. Coach Rushton even showed us his race walking form. 
If you really want to get fit, you can do the race walkers walk. <laughs> That's the Olympic event. <laughs> that good humor helps him relate to students. That and, well, being in better shape than many of them. The students, I think, are very receptive. I, I think when they see you, you're 80 years old and you're in this kind of shape. Uh, we were doing uh, recently uh, 50 push-ups, uh, 75 sit-ups. Uh, and uh, I think the fact that I do them with them as somewhat inspiring, I hope. Matthew Harbour is director of Ball State's adult physical fitness program. He says you don't have to be a marathoner or do 50 push-ups to see benefits. If you go back and read Hippocrates and some of the ancient philosophers, even then they were advocating moderate exercise and they would even advise against too much or too vigorous exercise. So the notion that the athlete or the athletic population is the goal is not necessarily accurate from a health perspective. The adult physical fitness program is open to the community, not just to Ball State people, and many folks benefit from the mutual encouragement that comes from exercising with others. So anything that can help encourage people to exercise, like the social component, absolutely helps. There is a huge behavioral aspect to exercise. There are certainly social circles that form. Um, you even notice when people come in, for instance, at the noon hour, uh, they regularly see uh, a group of individuals that they normally exercise with. They may not be friends per se, but they're comfortable exercising in an environment with people that they know are in a similar situation. And so it kind of decreases the stigma uh, for them and allows them to be more comfortable in exercising. Not surprisingly, there are plenty of misconceptions we have about exercise. Uh, number one, exercise does not have to be complicated. Uh, the number one thing is to do something. Um, doing nothing is not an option. And in fact, lack of exercise is not the same thing as just not exercising. There are actually uh, health deficits that come with not exercising. And it's not just that you don't get the benefits of exercising. Uh, so doing something, moving in general is good. Um, I think some people are intimidated by all the different variables, all the different equipment that you see. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to be complicated. Anything that involves movement, anything that involves increasing the heart rate, increasing the breathing rate, those are good things uh, to help stimulate the body to try to be more healthy. If you need a break from all that working out, there are some good getaway choices in a few spots you may not have considered before. We've talked about Indiana's greenways, the festivals, and even the county fairs on Indiana Weekend. But don't forget about the state's art museums when you're looking for a weekend excursion. Places like the Snipe Museum at Notre Dame, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, the Idle Jorg in Indianapolis, and of course, the Indianapolis Museum of Art. There's also the David Owsley Museum at Ball State, of course, and down the road in Richmond. The Richmond Art Museum is most noted for the fact that we are the only public art museum in the United States housed within an active public high school and that has been the tradition for over 117 years. Our community believed in uh, having arts and culture available to the students. Um, it, this is also the birthplace of the first high school orchestra in America. So it was through some of our local patrons that it came to be that the uh, museum was permanently housed in the Richmond Community School Center. And so today we offer over 280 programs uh, we offer year-round art classes. We have started the New Richmond Group in which area artists can come to the museum uh, to paint, uh, to learn from each other, to mentor, uh, to critique works. Uh, we have a collection of Indiana art as well as American Impressionism. And uh, it's, it's a real treasure in, in our state. The David Owsley Museum of Art at Ball State underwent a major expansion three years ago. The new East Wing includes galleries featuring Asian art from China, India, and Japan. There's a wonderful statue of the Buddha. It's um, the 17th century made in Japan. It's an Amida Buddha. Beautiful, large-scale bronze. And in fact, there is a tradition here that students place a penny in front of the Buddha as an offering. And it brings them good luck. So every time we clean up the large pile of pennies in front of the Buddha, another one immediately grows back. The core of the collection started with the Ball family's 
uh, paintings, really. And they had a lot of wonderful American Impressionist pictures. But one of the real favorites here is a painting by J. Otis Adams, who was related to the Ball family, and in fact, David Owsley calls him his Uncle Jack. And J. Otis Adams painted a wonderful picture called Poppy Land. The museum's namesake is not just a donor, but a kind of inspiration felt throughout all the galleries. David Owsley is really a central figure here, and that's why we named it after him. He's been giving works of art for many years, and he's also been helping us financially for some time. And he acts as kind of a curator, uh, a guide. We sometimes joke that he's a bodhisattva. You know, bodhisattvas are are Buddhist monks who've risen to the highest level of nirvana, but they've chosen to come back to the world to help guide others on that path. And I think that's what David is doing here. He has some suggestions to help get the most out of a museum visit. Check out the website, for example. Get basic information on things like parking and hours. Then come into the museum and look around. And do this with every museum in Indiana when, when you're visiting. Does the architecture detract from the works of art or does it enhance them? Do the, the furnishings inside the galleries, the pedestals, the glass cases, etc., do they stand in, in the way? Are they blocking your view of the work of art? Or do they fall back and allow the work of art to stand forward and, and, and really to speak to people? And that's the other thing, is look at a work of art and think, what is the message that this artist is trying to convey? What are they trying to express through this work? And that can be done with works of art, ancient Chinese through modern and contemporary art. What are they trying to say? The museum experience may be changing, partly in a bid to attract new and younger visitors. We actually encourage photography in the galleries. No flash, of course, for lots of reasons. Uh, one is flash can damage uh, delicate paints, but also it really annoys people when they're getting flashes in their eyes. But otherwise, if you want to take photos with your smartphone, please do. Uh, if you want to post that online, we ask you to do that. If you'd like to take a selfie, as long as you don't do anything dangerous that's going to harm yourself or work of art, please take selfies. Um, you need to be aware of this kind of phenomenon that people like to be more involved, and that's fine. Art programs in some local schools have been cut as budgets are tightened. That has figured into the museum's plans. The wonderful thing about a world art collection is, no matter what your background is, your heritage is represented here. Whether your background is in Africa or Asia or South America, you can find something here that connects you with your, your, your background. So it's wonderful for students to come here, especially K through 12. And we do have some strong programs that bring those students in to learn, to teach with the art, to get them activated and active in the galleries. Um, I think we served over 3,000 students last year, but we'd like to expand that a great deal. To help visitors navigate the galleries, the museum has a large and active group of docents. They run wonderful programs every weekend and often during the weeks. Um, they work as interpretive guides as well. They'll answer questions in the galleries. They will help you to look at works of art if you're feeling some difficulty there. But I think another important point is that all of the skills you use in the art museum are transferable to many different fields. For example, this de describing, just looking for clues and details, those are the exact same skills that one uses as a detective or a policeman or any other scientific field that you can think of. This kind of experiments with careful observation, that can be done here. And I think starting with kids is important um, and working with students at the university as well. Those two age groups are they're wonderful because they, they're ready to learn. Finally, it may or may not become a popular local attraction, but a new downtown feature in Muncie is off to a good start. The city has built this decorative canal that leads to the White River. It's actually part of the stormwater drainage system and maybe one of the nicest sanitary district projects you'll see. Ball State student Nick Burling was here for the opening and has this look at the project. It's all about sustainability. You take the environment, the economy, 
and, and the neighborhood into account. For example, in quality of life, we said, well, how could your project, even this sewer underground, can benefit this neighborhood? How can it help economic development in the city? We want something that people will enjoy 30 years from now. So instead of putting a big pipe underground, let's go ahead and make it an open channel. Let's go ahead and make it a canal. And it makes you think differently. And it makes these engineers that are all nuts and bolts and tenths of a foot think bigger. started looking at how we begin to redevelop our downtown. We knew that the storm drainage right down through the heart of the downtown on Walnut Street was only 18 inches in diameter. There wasn't any way in the world that was going to be able to accommodate the growth in the downtown and the growth in the surrounding neighborhoods. So to begin to try and put together what's going to work and knowing that we have a federal and IDEM mandate on stormwater separation, it made sense to try to figure out how do we tie all that in. Bottom line, they decided to create the ARC Hotel facility, which is this eight-story building that's being built downtown. Um, in addition, there's a big parking garage that's building right next to it. Those two structures were built right along those 18-inch pipes that were not nearly big enough to build that, to take any waste, uh, stormwater runoff or the wastewater that would be generated by the hotel. So that was problem A. Problem B, these are combined sewers. We're under a mandate by IDEM to separate out the sewage from the storm. We had to get to the downtown anyway, so we decided, the Muncie District decided to combine those two things and construct a very large network of storm sewers through the downtown. I think it's pretty. It's, yeah. an, it's a place to walk, and it was fun watching them do it. We take a walk now and then. We didn't get to see all of it. Watching but, the construction of it. But, it was uh, interesting. Well, I think it, it's a good project. It's uh, this into town needs something. And they had said something about building a bridge across the river. I'd love it. if A walking bridge, I'd love that. A foot bridge. Yeah. That would be so much fun. We would probably walk more. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> just to stand over the water and feel free. This is going to be a small segment of a very large uh, plan for the city of Muncie. Uh, there's going to be a bridge that is going to go uh, across the river, which will tie to uh, the university, the Ball State. On this side over here, there's a culture trail that's going to be built that will tie the uh, the neighborhood here on the west side with the downtown and eventually the south side. So it's really taking that Washington Street and Franklin Street neighborhood and, and revitalizing them. Um, and, and that's a good thing to see. We did not have that in mind. My practice is located right across the street from the canal, Washington Street, downtown Muncie. I, I've definitely noticed the canal has changed the way this whole area, this side of town, this side of downtown looks because it, it beautified the area. And it's good for Muncie. It's good for downtown. You know, people, some people, they don't realize what we have downtown. I don't know. There's somebody that might be interested in that. Um, here's this one back. Okay. okay, so we got two. Well, I think that anything that draws people to the downtown has a positive effect on the businesses here. So in that sense, if it does draw people, which I'm, I'm sure it will draw some, that is a positive effect on the downtown. And you know, they're trying to make a lot of improvements in the downtown area related to the other part of the city, and I think that's always a plus. There's not many empty storefronts now even, so you know, we've kind of passed the slum era and got into, you know, I guess a first generation of regeneration. So all these things work together. So here's the deal. Three years from now, 2018, we're going to all meet again. I'd like you to commit to come back out here and we're gonna see the bounce that this neighborhood's been getting already based on this. As an infrastructure person, 
Working for a district that does infrastructure, this is what it's all about. Is there anything more important with your work than to, re than to revitalize the neighborhood in Muncie? I would argue there's nothing more, more important that we could do. A look at the new downtown Muncie Canal, Liberty Pass, with contributor Nick Merling. And that's our show for today. Glad you could join us and hope you'll be with us next time as we find more stories off the beaten path from around the state on Indiana Weekend.